This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much for coming, those of you who have come, and welcome. If I could just introduce, um, introduce our speakers, introduce um, the Institute of Online Language Research, uh, which is part of the School of Advanced Study. Um, I'm delighted to welcome, first of all, Didier Iribon, who's the author of uh, Retour à Reims, translated as uh, Returning to Reims. Uh, Didier is a very prominent lecturer in France. He's a professor of sociology at the University of Amiens. Uh, the other works of his which have been translated are, are a book called uh, Réflexion sur la question gay, which is translated as Insult of the Making of the Gay Self, published in 1999, uh, and a biography of, of Foucault. Uh, you also see, uh, hopefully, as the conversation develops, that Didi is very interested in transmarche or transchannel and indeed transatlantic intellectual exchanges and so on, and I think that will come out in discussion. And uh, Jeffrey Weeks is uh, a research, now research pro professor in the Weeks Centre, which is named after you. I'm afraid so. Yes, well. Uh, Nothing so to do with me. For social policy studies at London South Bank University. And for a long time, has been one of the most uh, prominent uh, individuals, intellectuals, working on uh, the sociology and uh, theories of sex and sexuality in Britain. Has been very prominent in, in gay politics in Britain for a very long time. Uh, his works include Coming Out, Homosexual Politics in Britain of the 19th Century to the Present in 1977, Sexuality and Its Discontents, 1985, Making Sexual History, 2000. This is going to be a very, very informal uh, event, uh, needless to say. Um, uh, Jeffrey is going to kick off a discussion and is going to um, ask some questions of DDA uh, and his book. We're going to learn a bit about what, what, what the book is, what the book is about, and the way it links to a lot of very important and pressing uh, issues in, in politics in general and, and in sexual politics in, in particular. So perhaps I can yield the floor to Jeffrey and we can... We, we can <coughs> okay, well thanks very much. Um, well, let me begin by saying that it's a great honour to to be here um, and to discuss uh, his book with, with Didier. Um, I found this book immensely moving, um, but more than that, it did two things, I think. First of all, it raised a whole series of issues about my own life and my own trajectory, because I come from a working class family, South Wales Mining Valley, um, and um, I'm gay, and the tensions between my class and my sexuality have, in a sense, dominated the whole of my life, personally, politically, um, and intellectually. So I found a tremendous number of echoes um, in, in, the, in the book. Um, but secondly, I think uh, what's interesting about it is that it raises a whole series of intellectual, theoretical, and political issues by exploring the life. Um, and his own life um, and I think that's a really important uh, way of, uh, of doing it because lots of the theories around sexuality and I blame myself in part for this have been all too abstract, detached, um, not necessarily related to how people live sexuality and the gap between theories and uh, lived experience are enormous and I think what's important about the book is that it brings the two together in a very readable, very accessible um, and very profound way. Um, so for me this is a, a major intellectual event but also a political um, and uh, personal event. Um, I'd like to start uh, with a question um, which may seem a little um, away from the centre, but it seems to me it's at the centre of this book, and it's, as it happens, it's been at the centre of my own interests. And that's Raymond Williams and his uh, novel Border Country. Because the last chapter of, uh, of the book um, recounts how um, Didier delayed reading Raymond Williams' novel um, until he was writing this last chapter because he was afraid it might influence him too much. Now, I'm not sure how many of you know the novel. Uh, Raymond Williams was uh, from a working class background, became a professor in Cambridge, um, and um, he was one of the founders of cultural studies. Um, 
best known for his first major book, Culture and Society, but a host of others. Um, and Border Country is a key book in his own development. Um, he rewrote it a number of times um, through 20 years. Um, it was a key book in his own personal development and he saw it as important as the um, uh, more formal academic work of culture and society. Um, and in it he traces the tensions, ambiguities of um, someone born in the 1920s, but echoing those born in the 40s and 50s, um, of coming from a working class background, going to Cambridge, um, and the difficulties, tensions, problems of reconciling yourself with a working class background. Um, so that book is a key book in his development, but it turns out it's a key book in my development and I was delighted to see a key book in Didier's reading as well. So I'd like to begin by asking you why you delayed reading it so long um, and how it reflected back as you were reading it during writing the last chapter. Um, thank you, Bill, and thank you, Jeffrey, for this uh, discussion. Um, uh, first of all, I, I would add one point of um, um, <coughs> the importance for me to, to write, uh, even in the most theoretical way, um, in a way which is grounded in my personal experience, and that this is what I learn. Um, that, um, for me, it's difficult to separate the personality of the person writing from what he or she writes, uh, even when it's a question of a theoretical or philosophical writing. And um, um, <coughs> this um, implication of the subject who writes uh, with uh, uh, what he or she writes is uh, for me very, very important. Uh, I consider this book, uh, to Reims, Returning to Reims, not only as uh, autobiographical uh, uh, reci, narrative, but also as a theoretical and political book. But um, in a way, I, what I try, I don't know if I, if, if I was successful in doing it, but what I try to do is uh, to uh, integrate different levels of, uh, of um, uh, personal, political, and uh, social, of course, and theoretical, in, to integrate all that dimensions in one book. Uh, it was not that easy to write, of course. And, um, of course, um, I, I re, uh, one of my main references are um, novelists and uh, writers, because I, I always think that there are more uh, theoretical insights in uh, some uh, uh, novels or work by a uh, writer than in um, sociological or philosophical uh, pieces or writings. And uh, for example, of course, Annie Ernaud or James Baldwin or John Edgar Whiteman has been very, have been a very, very influential on my, on my, my own writing, especially in this uh, book. And to answer your question about Raymond Williams, I read um, um, the essays by Williams, uh, um, Culture and Society, uh, The Long Revolution, and uh, I liked very much his uh, book of interviews with the New Left Review, uh, uh, Politics and Letters. And uh, I have been reading that when um, much before of, uh, I, uh, I would have thought of writing such a book. And um, when I, I was f trying to find a reference in Politics and Letter to write this about uh, the, his criticism of Richard Hogarth's uh, uh, uses of literacy. And so I, I, I took the book, Politics and Letters, to find the the page in which he, Raymond Williams uh, um, criticized um, 
not exactly, it's not directed to Richard, uh, directly against Richard Ogart, but we can imagine that it is what he, he meant. And I realized that several chapters of the book are devoted to his novels. And uh, so I did not have that, those books, those novels at home, so I order, tried to find them on the internet, order them, and then when uh, Border Country arrived, um, when I get the book, uh, I started reading it and said, I'm, maybe I, I, I must postpone the reading of the, of the book because it would be, um, it would be a frame, an inescapable frame for, for my writing. So, and when I read that, it, um, it was very, very striking for me that uh, how, how smart, how uh, sen sensitive, how, how important was the, uh, what he, he achieved in, in this novel. And uh, so I was, uh, I was right. Um, not to, I'm sorry for my English, I arrived two, two, two hours ago, and as everybody knows, it, it takes always at least a few days in, uh, before to, to get used to, to, to speak, and um, two hours is not enough. Uh, but, um, so, I, I was very glad of uh, reading the book, but um, retrospectively, uh, it was like my book at, with, with a very big difference. Uh, he, he was not a gay writer. <laughs> he's straight. Not that I, I, I do blame it for, for that. It's not the point. But uh, it makes a lot of difference of because he he kept a strong uh, link with his uh, um, the place where he was born, with his uh, family, especially with his father. Uh, uh, not as, uh, he escaped from uh, his uh, milieu, from, from his background, familial and uh, social and cultural and uh, geographical background, but he kept a strong link, at least in his mind. And for me, uh, the problem was completely different. It's uh, um, because of what I, what I, I considered at that time, because of, of my uh, sexual orientation, I had to break relationship with my uh, family and my uh, milieu. Uh, and I would say that when I read the, the second novel by uh, Raymond Williams, Second Generation, which is a very bad book, um, but a country is very, very, very good very classical but very good novel. The second generation is is, a, is, is a, I can say a bad book and you see in that book how um, he has in his mind because he's, he remained linked to his family uh, some conservative uh, uh, assumptions about uh, sexual freedom, sexual liberation, and uh, family values, and uh, um, where the, um, the sexual liberation in middle cl in the academia, in uh, middle class uh, uh, circles in Oxford, are a threat for. Uh, the, re the perpetuation of traditional values, working class values. And uh, this opposition in between uh, working class values and uh, liberation, sexual liberation, uh, is one of the most striking part of this second book. But as we discussed before coming here, uh, you know, in the room just uh, next door, uh, Maybe it was also, uh, you, you can feel that also in the first novel, Border Country, not, not that uh, um, it's less uh, obvious, but it's, it's present too. And uh, it's maybe, maybe um, I would have too much influenced by the book, but maybe I would have also uh, been eager to dismiss the book because of that, and uh, so it was very good for me to to 
to postpone the reading of that novel. And I'm always struck by um, how so important people as uh, Richard Hogarth or Raymond Williams uh, who has been so influential on the, the beginning of uh, the, the launching the, the, of cultural studies has have been so um, heavily uh, marked, marked by, by some conservative impulse Purses, uh, according to uh, um, related to the, the, the defense of family values, um, the traditional role of women, and uh, Williams much less than Hogarth. But Hogarth is very, very, very conservative, and and uh, which is never uh, uh, acknowledged in France, where his book, uh, the uses of, lit of uh, literacy, is a kind of uh, uh, classical reference you cannot criticize. And, uh, but I, I did I criticize him in, in my last book, La Société comme Verdict, because I, I, I wanted to, to ask whether uh, we, we can think of cultural studies without uh, a reflection and self-reflection about this conservatism. And uh, maybe, okay. I think the... Um, <coughs> Just pursue that a little. The, um, the social conservatism of uh, Hoggart and Raymond Williams is very stark to a reader now, I think. Um, but at the time they were writing it, um, I think it was perhaps more understandable because it was an evocation of working class life. And working class life was socially very conservative. Um, and uh, I resolved it um, in my own personal life by, in a sense, having two lives. Um, by having my gay life in London and writing about sexuality um, and being quite well known as a writer on sexuality and appearing on television and, and in newspapers and so on as an activist and writer. Um, and continuing to be with my family um, seeing them regularly, um, nurturing, loving relationships. They met my partners. Um, without us ever talking about it. I mean, formally I had come out. They knew about my sexuality. But I remember vividly when I told my father I was gay in 1972, he said, we accept you because you're our son and we love you, but I'd rather you didn't talk about it with your brothers and we don't want you to bring shame on the family. So there was two lives going on, which were very difficult to reconcile. I struggled to reconcile them, and now they are reconciled. Um, um, for instance, my partner had a birthday a month or so ago, and my family came from South Wales, along with his family from the North East, both mining families, um, with a vast variety of friends, gay and straight. Um, and there's a sort of reconciliation now, after many, many years. But for too long, there were two separate lives. But, like Raymond Williams, I struggled to maintain them. What's striking about your book is that you, in a sense, for 30 years, couldn't reconcile them. There was a split, a physical, emotional split. You had very little contact, and then only through your mother, with your um, birth family. Um, that must have been an incredibly searing experience. And I just wonder if you could tell us a little more about how you negotiated that, how you endured that. Actually, I, I wouldn't say I, I, I succeeded in negotiating it. It's, uh, um, there was no negotiation in my mind. It was uh, a complete uh, split and uh, um, l'habitus clivé. Uh, uh, according to the, uh, the word by Pierre Bourdieu, habitus clive, the, the split habitus. And um, there were two persons in, in me, the, the, the one who, who has been a working class child and adolescent, and, and a new one who has, uh, because he was gay, um, 
had to escape from uh, this milieu. But it's what I try to show. Uh, it's very. Uh, this is before coming. I, I found the lecture, which was the starting point of the book, I, and the title of the lecture is "Frames of Memory," and I gave it in uh, 2008. And after. Having given this lecture, I started writing the book. And uh, frames of memory means that uh, um, the past, the, not only the present, but also the past you experience is, f uh, is built, uh, construed by the categories, the political categories of the present. And uh, so it was for me, uh, um, and this is why I'm very so interested in Raymond Williams and uh, Richard Agat's works. Not, not because I want to, to put them on trial. It's not, uh, we can admire uh, an author and crit criticize him or her. But um, it's that, that uh, social identities and political identities are, are not given ones. They are. Uh, uh, built, constructed by the categories, the political categories of the, the present in which you are uh, uh, um, involved. And I would say that um, the gay and lesbian movement gave me a frame to, uh, and a memory, uh, uh, and a past. Um, uh, the, the, the present, the, the political movement of the present gave me a past. Uh, when I think of myself, I was a gay child. But it's also linked, and this is what I try to show, uh, to the disappearance of Marxism in France and uh, uh, the, 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 the way of thinking in terms of class, social classes. And if I try to re-integrate uh, the uh, a way of thinking in terms of class, um, this is a new, this is another uh, way of thinking of my past. Uh, I was uh, I was a working class kid and a working class adolescent. And can I reconcile uh, the two uh, constructions, which are um, uh, anchored in uh, or linked to different framework yeah? and? Um, the construction of the past uh, is a performative construction of the past by the categories of the present. And um, the notion of intersection or intersectionality is very interesting here too. But the intersection is not given. You have to, to work uh, to, with, um, practically and intellectually to build it. Uh, intersection. Um, there is this very beautiful article by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, Crenshaw in, on intersectionality. But you cannot say, uh, it, it is a great article, but she, when she says that um, there is a, the blind spot of the anti-racist movement in America, which is uh, uh, feminist issues, and there is a blind spot of feminist movement, which is the race issue. Um, I do agree with that, but it's not that easy to think that a movement can reconcile different approaches, and uh, the intersection is is, um, is not a, something which is given, and uh, you cannot simply say uh, you have to consider that a woman of color is a woman of color, and because uh, you have to think that. The feminist movement is to think about uh, women. The bl black movement is to think about um, to, to fight for uh, civil rights, and of course, uh, you have to reintegrate in the landscape, political landscape, people who are at the intersection of the two movements. But it's not, uh, and uh, I would say it's not that easy. And for me, it was not that easy to reconcile the, the two. Uh, the two parts of my uh, own self. And uh, so I could say I am an inter as everybody, I am an intersectional subject, but this intersection has to be 
uh, is to be thought of, is to be ref uh, reflected, is to be constructed, is to, to, to be fight, is to be fought for. It's not a given. And um, if it was a given, if intersection was, was a given fact, a given reality, we, we would not have to discuss uh, how to reconcile different identities. And uh, I don't have any uh, easy answer to that question, how to reconcile different aspects of your, of your, uh, your own self, uh, different I, uh, I, political, cultural, social identities. And um, this is very, very, um, very difficult because uh, when you put the emphasis on one of your identities, you, you are led to push away at the other identities, and maybe um, maybe we sh we should not, but uh, it's nearly impossible not to do so. There's a very interesting book, uh, edited volume that came out uh, two three years ago, um, by um, Yvette Taylor and Sally Hines. Um, which looks at intersexuality and sexuality. And they've also edited a book on intersectionality in class. Um, and an um, interesting point made there is that um, we've become used to looking at intersectionality across a variety of subject categories, um, class, gender, um, race, um, and so on. But what's um, strikingly absent is one which attempts intersectionality around sexuality and class. Um, and in fact, that is a very difficult, has been a very difficult uh, link to draw. And some interesting work is now going on around that. But as DDA said, they still remain separate categories. And it seems to me it is only through um, intensely um, local studies and personal studies that you can actually see how the intersections are, are, are shaped and are lived. Um, in terms of my own um, uh, biography, um, I think for me, um, during the 60s, I, I was gay. I, I was also from a working class background, having a university education, trying to become an academic by writing a thesis and so on, the usual conventional ways. But there were separate lives, as I said earlier. Um, what gay liberation represented for me at first in the 1970s, early 1970s, was um, a way of bringing them together. Um, because I was involved in leftist politics in the gay movement. I was one of the editors of Gay Left. And we were precisely trying to reconcile class and sexuality. Um, in the end, I gave up the struggle. Um, I became um, more and more preoccupied with sexual theory um, and left class to others. Um, I lived it, but I, I couldn't write about it because the language just wasn't there. Marxism, I struggled with Marxism for 10 years, but it wasn't interested, it wasn't responsive to issues about sexuality. And then Marxism itself entered a terminal crisis anyway. So it was through contact with other theorists, um, like Foucault, that one began to chip away at these edifices of grand theory and try to come to a more useful uh, theoretical um, perspective. So in a sense, that effort at reconciliation in a would-be revolutionary movement failed um, for a variety of, of reasons, leaving, as I said at the beginning, two separate lives that were linked um, through my own personal efforts and the personal efforts of others that weren't lived together. Um, but I did get something from my background that I wonder if Didier could comment on this because it seems to me absent from the book and from your experience. For me, um, I was very preoccupied with ideas of community which obviously came from my working class background. My, my dissertation was called The Search for Community in the early 70s. Um, 
looking at uh, um, political theory and ideas of community in early 20th century political theory. Um, in retrospect, I can see how that is very much related to the sense of a loss of community from my working class uh, background. Community in South Wales is very intense. Working class community, the mining community, less so now, but it was very intense when I was growing up with all its gendered um, order. Um, and the idea of community, I've written about community, I've written about gay community, um, and the idea of community is very strong. And so is the idea of family. I don't think it's any accident um, that I have uh, written a book on um, alternative families, on same-sex families. It echoes many of my preoccupations. Now what's striking to me from that background is the way in which there doesn't really seem to be a working class community that you were leaving. The working class community in South Wales, the mining community, was very stable, very coherent, very inward looking, intense social capital within its limits. Um, your working class background was much more disparate. Your, your father was much more an itinerant worker, a variety of different working class jobs. Um, and I wonder if that absence of a coherent community shaped your development in a way mine was shaped by my own uh, background, but in a different way. You know, when I, when I was um, a teenager, I was a Marxist, I was a Marxist, a Trotskyist teenager, and uh, I reproached at that time my parents or my family not to be uh, revolutionary enough, and uh, they were working in, in, in the factories, and um, I was a, a student in a high school, and I was uh, blaming them for not being what I expected the working class to be, and ex people from uh, uh, being workers. Uh, I, want, I wanted them to, uh, what I want to get was uh, a new television, a, a new car, and, uh, and, and so on, uh, which was for me horrible. It was uh, what I called at that time the embourgeoisement and uh, um, a betrayal of, the, of the, the working class values and so on. So now, I, as when I was uh, writing Retour à Reims, my mother told me you were, um, you spoke uh, in that silly way a lot of t so often when you were younger and uh, um, yeah uh, so but I never um, experienced that sense of solidarity of community in the working class in which I was raised and um, there were strikes, there were demonstrations, there were, uh, there were trade unions, but uh, maybe in, in other parts of the country, in the, in, uh, uh, in the north west, uh, in the, in the um, uh, mining districts, in the, uh, where now um, people vote for the National Front, so it's, uh, maybe it's because the, this sense of community, of solidarity has been broken, and I'm sure it has been here for uh, uh, during uh, uh, decades, but it has disappeared. But I, this is, I, I don't know, this is what I read in books. Um, I, I, was not, I was not raised in that uh, area. Uh, in that uh, district of France, but where I I was raised, um, my my fam all, all my family uh, when I was young, um, my father said le parti the the party which was the communist party. It, it was no use to 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 say which party it was. Uh, they were talking about the party was uh, the communist party, and all my family were. Um, communist followers, communist voters, but I never experienced that sense of community in the working class, except maybe during uh, May 68 when some people of my family were uh, on strike, so have no salary. And I remember at home when my mother uh, um, cooked omelettes so for, for uh, the, the 10, 12 people because uh, people of the family were, had no money to, to, to eat. So it, it was a, a sense of 
familial uh, community, solidarity. So we can say a working class sense of, of solidarity. But I also experience uh, uh, a, a destruction of that sense of community. And also we were talking about intersection. Intersection, as I said, is very, very difficult. I, I could not. I was, a, uh, I was a, a, a Marxist teenager, and I realized very quickly <coughs> that there was no room for me as a young guy discovering his homosexuality within uh, Marxism, within uh, the, the, the Trotsky organization uh, of which I was a member, uh, a very active member at that time when I was uh, uh, 15 or 16. And um, so uh, I had to escape uh, not only my family, but also my Marxism, my idea of a uh, working class struggle to, to, to be able to be wh what I was or what I was becoming, uh, I mean, a gay, a gay teenager uh, and a gay, gay man. And um, the sense of community you, you mentioned, I found it um, when I arrived in Paris. Uh, in, the, in, in the gay circles, which is not always a very um, uh, wonderful community, but uh, as George Chon says, uh, so uh, well demonstrated, uh, there was a kind of uh, welcoming. You, you, you learn how to be gay while being uh, welcomed, uh, introduced in the in a kind of knowledge, culture, uh, uh, um, a subculture, and uh, so for me it was it was a way of of escaping my own uh, working class background and to reinvent myself as uh, um, a young young intellectual and young gay intellectual, and it. It took me a long time, a very, 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 very long time to reconcile the, uh, my background and my gayness. And um, which is, I, I would say that it, it, even today for a young, um, a, a young gay kid, it's not possible to be gay, openly gay, uh, freely gay in a working class uh, uh, neighborhood. And uh, I know uh, when I say that, uh, uh, some people are infuriated by uh, But um, the, the novel by my um, uh, former student, uh, Edouard Louis, which has been uh, published two months ago, and um, is exactly the story of, uh, of uh, um, emancipation uh, written by a guy who was uh, a victim, the victim of uh, homophobic uh, insult, of homophobic uh, physical assaults, and uh, how to to escape from that background to be to be able to be uh, gay, and for him to be able to be gay was to um, enter the the world of bourgeois culture, and what I wonder if there is some other possibilities um, to think of um, how to be gay without uh, completely breaking apart from one's background. And I, I, would, I would like, of course, to. And, uh, so to be, to be involved in what we can say the working class movement, which does not exist anymore in, in, that, in, the, in this uh, uh, sense, at least in France, but I, I would say maybe in Great Britain uh, neither. Uh, how can one be involved in the idea of a, a working class movement and in uh, um, trying to, to build a, a political discourse, a political approach in terms of uh, uh, um, sexual subjectivation or r racial subjectivation, and um, one of the most the, w one of the most uh, important book for me when I when I wrote uh, Retour is uh, is kind of memoir novel memoir I don't know by uh, John Edgar Wildman uh, Brothers and Keepers and where he tried to well where he he, he writes that. Uh, for him to become 
what he wanted to become was uh, the, uh, there was a necessity for him to uh, break completely with his family, and uh, this, uh, I knew the more separate from them I became, the the, uh, the more successful I was in what I, I was trying to achieve. He, he wrote, he, he writes, and he wrote, and. Uh, I recognize myself in this sentence, and um, there is a, a, a seduction of the, the of the, the legitimate culture, literary culture, uh, uh, the art, the theater, and, uh, and uh, which is a way for a lot of gay people to to get emancipated, to get liberated from kind of the burden of homophobia. Uh, and I know that there, there, is, there are all that many people to say, but there is also homophobia in the, in the bourgeoisie. We all know it, and we not deny it. But uh, um, it's all also a way to... Uh, uh, the access to culture, for me, was the way uh, to emancipation. emancipation. Not that I, uh, I like the word emancipation, but uh, in English I would not uh, know which word <laughs> to use to, ex to, to say precisely what... Uh, the, um, my book is a book about um, the process, the processes of subjectivation, how, how to escape from uh, the social mechanism who, who who are inscribed in your in your mind, inscribed in your body, in your gestures, in your, and uh, how to to undo them and uh, um, undoing the social reproduction by and wh why why did I is I differ from my brothers? Why did I? Was I able to survive in an academic system uh, which is completely devoted, that it, 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 it looks like completely devoted to eliminate and expel from uh, it, it's, uh, from it the, the, the people from the, uh, from the working class and which are eliminated from the school system in France? in a, a systematic way. And uh, I would say that it's because homosexuality compelled me to, um, to defer from my uh, family by getting, um, wanted eagerly to, 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 to step in the bourgeois culture, legitimate culture, to read books, to read, to read novels, to, to read Marguerite Duras, uh, uh, and, and, and so on, and uh, to read Jean Genet, to read uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so, um, the sense of community, it's the working class community, which is very often grounded on homophobia or um, the inferiorization of women and so on, um, male domination and um, um, masculinist values and, and so on. Uh, this sense of community, which m maybe existed, it was precise. Was precisely what I wanted to escape from. So um, I, I know it's uh, it's always difficult to deal with this. Uh, um, especially retrospectively, I, I know what happened, but not that I'm very proud of what happened, and even if I wanted it. And, but uh, to be ashamed of his family is, uh, is not something uh, very... It is, it's not a very good feeling, a very beautiful feeling, but I was. And, uh, and I had to, uh, at one point of my life, I had to... Uh, to write about that, and uh, because it, I, I submitted myself to the violence of the social order, and, uh, and maybe it's not possible to, to do otherwise. A major theme in, in this book, but also <coughs> in your other books, is the power of insult. Um, and the strength of 
a sense of shame um, which pervades the, the life of the marginalised. Um, um, and you, you, you do it very powerfully in, in, in the book which is translated as insult. Um, what strikes me is how strong this sense of shame is, or the theme of shame is in, in post-AIDS gay literature in the States. Um, it's strong in your work, and yet it doesn't seem to be pervasive in this country, in the literature in this country, any longer. Um, and I wonder what that says about the different sexual cultures as they're emerging of the United States, um, with its sort of impasse, the cultural um, impasse there. Um, France with its republican values and its scepticism about a sense of community of, of groups um, and the more open pluralistic culture that Britain is becoming, whether you sense this difference, whether you, um, whether it's a true difference or it's just my imagination. Oh, no, no, there, there, there is a true difference. At least in, in the discourses in France, you, there is no communities, there is only citizens and individuals. Uh, uh, this is a, um, but um, even if the, the book Insult, and, which has been, Reflexion sur la question, mm. which has been translated as Insult and the Making of the Gay Self. Maybe it's not a very good title in English, I don't want to be not quite sure. But uh, um, it was a reference to Sartre, uh, Reflexion sur la question juive, but it did not make sense in, in English because this is, uh, Sartre's book has, has not the same title, it's uh, anti-Semites and Jews, so it did not mean, uh, the reference w w would have been lost, so, uh, the publisher decided to change the title. Anyway, uh, I think insult. Even if my my focus on insult was a way of trying to uh, challenge the idea of uh, um, citizenship. Everybody has the same right, which of course was not true and is not true. But the the, the philosophical. A statement about individual to be a citizen is to have as an individual the same right as anybody else. But uh, France, French Republic, does not know about communities, and communities are against the idea of a nation grounded on equality of uh, individuals. And, and uh, it's the legacy of the French Revolution okay, and philosophy des Lumières, Enlightenment. Okay, but. What I, I try to show, because it, it was what, what I experienced, it's insult put you in a community, in a collectivity. If, if I am called uh, a faggot in the street, it's not because I, even bef before I, I know that I am what I am described as by the insult, um, it's not me who decided to be part of a group. It's, the, the insult which take me, put me in that group, and um, not only uh, on the very moment of where, when the insult is, uh, is shouted to me, but um, insult is a kind of a social uh, dimension. Uh, the, the first chapter, the monde d'insult, the word of insult, uh, images, uh, discourses, uh, uh, movies, literature are insulting from where? Uh, for during a long time, insulting for minorities, and um, this word of insult cons constitutes or inscribe inscri inscribe you in categories, categorize you, and put you in categories. If, even if you don't want to be part of that category, you are so uh, you are put in, in it. So it's not. The community is not because you decide to be a member of a collectivity, of a, of a group. It's because uh, uh, the insult puts you, and the word of insult tells you that you are a member of these categories called the faggot or the niggers or, or, or the Jews or whatever. So there is, um, 
there was different response to that, to deny it. I, uh, uh, I'm not part of that collectivity. Uh, I, I like I like men, but I, I'm not gay, and so. But there was a, the other other way of uh, responding to the insult, which is um, the um, the very ground of uh, a political movement like uh, gay, Black is Beautiful, Gay Pride, and, and which is the the. Inversion, the inversion, the inversion, uh, uh, the inversion of the of the Reverse, insert, reversing. the reversing of the of the insert, and to um, to take the insert as, uh, to, uh, like Jean-Paul Sartre said in uh, his uh, book on Jean Genet, to to refuse to be the object of the gaze, but to become. The subject of the discourse on the gaze, and uh, so, but it does mean that you never escape from the insult and the word of insult. But you transform it, you accept the categorization, and you use it as the way of subjectivation, reformulation of your subjectivity, but also as a way of politization. We 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 enter. In politics, through the re reversal of uh, of the insult and uh, on the devaluation, the de deroga derogatory uh, signification of the words, and um, so insult was a, an attempt to show that uh, uh, there is no we cannot oppose on the one on one hand uh, individual on the other one communities that. Um, individuals are always uh, anchored in community, at, at least by the uh, der derogatory vocabulary of the insult, and, uh, which is everywhere. Um, I could just chip in just, just to take up Jeffrey's theme of the differences and similarities uh, across France, Britain, the US, and so on. We, we were talking about this earlier as well. The, um, uh, on the one hand, you, your book very powerfully brings home that the commonalities of experience of this kind of itinerary of being working class and gay and so on uh, in a, its own very visceral way. On the other hand, as Jeffrey was alluding to, the, the, the differences between the contexts are, are, are quite interesting to explore as well. I, mean, the, and I think one thing that strikes me, for example, is the difference in terms of being in the provinces in France and being in a small provincial town is different from being in Manchester, Swansea, yeah. or, or whatever. Just, so there's the questions of geography as well. But I think the, the question I, I wanted to ask to, to, to develop um, these comparisons is one of the very striking things of the past year has been the very different responses to the gay marriage. Uh, yeah. by, uh, it's striking between, and different. Between, between, between Britain and France. Uh, and I wondered just whether you could, you could I mean, obviously there was opposition here from the usual suspects and so on. We had a UKIP politicians saying that the floods of this winter were caused by gay marriage and so on. Uh, but there was relatively marginal compared to um, the kinds of responses in France. So I just wanted to hear whether you could just say a bit about a bit about that reception, that context, <coughs> where, where that opposition was coming from and how, how that might relate to some of the um, analyses that you've made. We, we learned or we we were reminded that uh, political and social movements are not only left-wing movements, but could be massively and uh, heavily right-wing movement. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's all these people who demonstrated it's hundreds of thousands uh, every uh, twice a month during one year and a half. Uh, demonstrating against uh, gay marriage and uh, um, to advocate to, to to defend traditional values, they did exist at that, uh, everywhere. We knew that they were there, but we did not see them. And it's precisely we, we could use uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's vocabulary: serialité and group from people. They were scattered. Individual and suddenly they gathered together in the streets, and this is a huge, one of the most important 
political movement in France uh, for decades, and it was ugly, it was upsetting, it, it was disgusting, but there were hundreds of thousands in the, in the streets. And there are two things. The first is, uh, I would say that we have to remember, and if we did not remember, we, we could see that, that there is a huge and a massive tradition of uh, conservatism, heavy uh, uh, conservatism in France, right wing. France is not uh, uh, only uh, uh, a country of freedom, of, uh, it, it's also um, all these conservative people were against uh, uh, abortion, against uh, divorce, against um, this, um, the influence of the, of the Catholic Church and is very, very important. And um, the second thing that I would have to, to, to tell that I, I have to, to attack once more the Socialist Party as a government party. This should have been voted 15 years ago. And if there are demonstrators in the street now against gay marriage or last year against gay marriage, it's because Contrary to what happened uh, in uh, Belgium, in uh, the Netherlands, in, or in Spain, or in Portugal, the Socialist Party, they didn't want to do that. And they explicitly said, um, we don't want that, uh, we are okay for some rights for gay people, but we are against uh, adoption, against uh, uh, procreation medicalement assisté, uh, artificial insemination, uh, and against gay marriage, against, against uh, uh, because, uh, and they were ideal, it's not because, uh, they didn't say because the society is not ready to do that. It's, it was because they were against this move. And, and they, all of them said that in newspapers, in TV programs, and we, we uh, if we are French, we live in a conservative country, but uh, the, um, unfortunately the leaders of the left-wing party or the socialist party are not far from being as conservative as uh, uh, the right wing, the Catholic right wing. And if you read what was written in, in journal uh, like uh, La Revue Esprit, it's exactly what against gay marriage, against gay adoption, against uh, gay kinship, filiation, and so on. It's exactly what 15 years at the moment of the, the discussion, the debates about the PACs. Uh, domestic partnership, what they, what they wrote against with the threat of uh, um, the um, destruction of uh, la différence des sexes, which is a kind of, which was for, for these people a kind of nightmare, and for the, 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 the ministers of the, uh, in, in the socialist government at that time. And um, it's exactly the same words, the same uh, mottos, the same slogans that the right wing and the far right wing used and shouted in the streets of Paris last year. And uh, they, they, keep, they keep on uh, shouting them now and uh, against Christian Taubira or uh, yesterday. Um, so there are two things. that We live in a conservative country and uh, there is a huge conservative part of the country. But unfortunately, I would say that the socialist government, the, the, the left-wing parties, are not uh, le left-wing enough. And I, I don't know why it happened in France. I, it's suddenly, uh, but what I know is it should not have happened, and it would not have happened if all these uh, laws had been voted 15 years or 10 years ago. And so, um, what happened last year is. Ils récoltent ce qu'ils ont semé. Ils ont développé ça. Yeah, and uh, so it's. Um, can can we, I just ask you a just question? One, about that? We, uh, one, one of, uh, one of the, the starting point of that book is when I saw. When I realized that my, uh, 
people of my in my family were moving to a vote for the right wing and the far right wing. And uh, what happened? And uh, it is it is not only the it is not the only uh, starting point. What it is one of the starting points of the book. What happened in in French society and in French working class and in the French left uh, in order to to understand what what was at stake for people of my family who were communists to move to the to the right and to the right wing, which was for them the right wing and the far right wing was some something uh, the the right wing were their enemies and they were voting for the enemy now and uh, so uh, this is what i i try to understand in, in two chapters of the of the book um, I, I don't know the, the situation in England, but I, I would say that um, no, I know there are a lot of conservative people here, but um, as, as everywhere, <laughs> unfortunately, and more and more uh, now in Europe. But, um, and it's, not a, it's a right-wing government who, which issued the, the law when the law passed. And, um, so the difference between the two countries are striking. I, I, and I must confess, I, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, explain that differences, th those differences. Maybe you, you can explain it them better than I, I can. Uh, I want to ask you a specific question about that, but if I could just address your last point first. Um, it, what's striking about the right in Britain and, uh, and France, it seems to me, is the way in which in Britain the right has been captured by neoliberalism, the free state. Um, Margaret Thatcher's revolution in the 80s was about setting people free, free to um, be economically free, and she was socially conservative. But the logic of that sort of neoliberalism is to encourage individualism, actually. Um, and once you set that going, um, it's very difficult to stop it and say you can't be free in making choices about your personal life. But I want to come but back there, 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 there was, a, a, um, at least in France, a lot of discourses advocating economic liberalism, but opposing uh, social, cultural, sexual liberalism. So we can have both. And uh, on the far left wing today, um, they, they want to have both too. It's, uh, uh, it's different. We have to fight against neoliberalism, uh, not only in the in the world of economics, but also in the world of culture. And um, this, the the very symptoms of uh, liberalism, of the the, the tri triumph of, li of liberalism, is gay marriage, gay uh, everybody. Uh, uh, claiming for their rights, and um, so there is also um, a left-wing, or so-called uh, apparently left-wing, uh, anti-liberalism, which is as conservative, according to to if you if you refer to to cultural uh, uh, issues, um, as as conservative as the the, the right-wing one. One factor you talk about in the book and in Insult is the power of uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis. Yeah. Um, and I think that's quite important for your analysis because, in a sense, the, uh, the law of the father um, dominates, has captured left-wing thinking around issues like filiation in, in, in terms of uh, same-sex marriage and so on. In, in Britain, psychoanalysis has tended to be taken up um, in a much more flexible way, um, very strong in, in feminists, for instance, less so in, in LGBT circles, uh, but has, has in a sense junked the, the strict um, um, patriarchalism of, uh, of Lacanianism. And I wonder to what extent that is still embedded in the thinking of, of left-wing um, theorists in France. Yeah. Psychoanalysis is very, very uh, uh, prominent in the discourses, and, and not only in, um, in the intellectual field, but also in the political field. When the law was uh, being uh, discussed, 
um, at the parliament before um, the discussion, they invited psychiatrists, psychoanalysts to, to ask them, uh, what do you think of gay marriage? What do you think of gay affiliation, of gay uh, kinship? And psychoanalysts, it's a nightmare, it's a destruction of civilization, the, the destruction uh, in the parliament, because they were invited. And uh, I, I don't know the situation here, but I, I, I would assume that the uh, psychoanalysts are not invited to give their uh, uh, advice to, to the <laughs> government in order to frame the words of a, uh, un, uh, of a, of a new law. And in France, it, it happens, it always happens. And it's, it's very strange that uh, those experts of my life or your life are uh, um, um, denying me rights are uh, uh, invited uh, constantly. Um, but Retour is, is, is uh, an anti psychoanalytic book. It's an attempt to think about uh, all these issues without uh, referring to, uh, to psychoanalysis. When I was writing it, a friend of mine whose wife is a psychoanalyst told me. If you're writing a book on your father and your mother, you will, you wrote a book, Échappé à la psychanalyse, escaping from psychoanalysis. You wrote that book, but now that you are dealing with uh, your relationship to your mother and your father, you obviously have to uh, uh, refer to psychoanalytic concepts or approaches like a complex de deep, uh, deep or, uh, I said. I know I, I, it did not happen in my mind. I, I, I did not. I, I've not thought about that w uh, one minute. So, and I, the uh, the the expectations of a book uh, are framed by uh, psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic discourses, and so I wrote a page saying. Um, I will not refer to the Oedipal complex and so on because it would be desocialized and so depoliticize the issues I want to uh, uh, raise and uh, confront in that uh, in that book. And uh, for me, the problem, for example, I, I, in in my last book, La Société comme verdict, I try to think how um, we have to replace. The, the Oedipus by the, uh, uh, the school system. And uh, how long do you, did you frequent the school system? Did you go to the university or not? And the difference between the father and, and the sons, the mother and the daughters, is much more explainable by the um, different uh, frequentation of the school system than by all this familial stuff. So it was an attempt to uh, to l leave aside, I can say, to set aside, the, set aside the, um, all this familial and, uh, apparatus um, which is framed and in, imposed in the culture by psycho psychoanalysis. And what I, I wanted to do is uh, not only to, to try to oppose the conservative discourses of psychoanalysts or about gay marriage or all those issues, a symbolic order or whatever, but also to try to uh, liberate, to free, to free uh, the, um, the thought and the work of, of thinking in France from psychoanalysis and especially from, um, you know, I, I'm a Foucauldian, so um, I, I oppose very often the um, um, Freudo Marxism of the 70s as a way of thinking of sexual liberation. I oppose that uh, following Foucault, uh, uh, History of Sexuality, first volume. But uh, now I have to oppose. And I, to say that I prefer that Freudo Marxism, which was trying to think about emancipation, I prefer that to the uh, 
Stalino-Lacanianism, which has been uh, put on the on the um, on, in the on, on, uh, l'avant-scene uh, the it is put to the foreground, to the foreground uh, by some left-wing thinkers. Uh, um, always, um, I, I can I can give names: uh, uh, Badiou, Gijek, and so on, which is always linked. This kind of Lacano, uh, Stalino Lacanianism, or, La, or, or Lacano Stalinism, uh, uh, you can reverse the word, which is always linked for me to a very, very, very uh, um, profound kind of homophobia. And, uh, and I, I resent it very strongly, this, some of you. I, I feel it when they speak. Uh, this is a, a masculinist way of thinking. And uh, we can deal with uh, the working class issues which are raised today without uh, trying to revive all the masculinist culture and all the uh, Lacanian apparatus. And, uh, because for me, Lacan was one of the most uh, reactionary and uh, one of the most homophobic thinkers of the 20th century. I think it's, it's, it's perhaps also true to say that um, the psychoanalysis still has some purchase in some academic circles. In yeah. Britain, I don't know what you recall, did you? But when we did the workshop on the uh, yeah, yeah. in 2010, I think you were precisely in the name of psychoanalysis and why didn't you, you know, talk about your you know, the Oedipal relation to your father and so on. Um, you were accused of sociological reductionism. Yeah, um, yeah. In, 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 in the book, uh, it has to be said. There that is always an accusation of uh, sociological reduction by people who are. Um, who never think about society. Who, who are, who, 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 yeah, uh, when you, you try to think about society, and this accusation come from people comes from people who are um, constantly uh, framing uh, psychoanalytic reduction. Uh, and um, sociological determinism by people who are framing a psychoanalytic determinism. And uh, I, 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 uh, um, I, I know this is discussion, but uh, um, there is more, uh, uh, the, the, psychoanal the Lacanian at least, uh, uh, way of thinking is more determinist than the sociological one. And I don't know why I'm always uh, um, recalled to uh, um, my, uh, uh, reduced to my uh, sociological reduction uh, when I, I try to undo the psychoanalytic reduction. And um, I, I would say that uh, what I tried, I, we, one of my uh, purpose, not, not, not the only one, is it, it would not be very interesting if it were the, the only one. One of my purpose is to free the uh, l'activité de pensée, the, uh, the, the, the intellectual life, to free it from uh, psychoanalysis and, and Lacanianism. And I know it's, uh, it's not an easy task because I, uh, I know that Lacan is uh, very important in, in the UK and, um, and read very differently than, I, than uh, the way I read it, but the way I read it is what, what he explicitly, explicitly stated. And in the US where uh, Lacan has been uh, one of the um, ground, the Lacanian, uh, Lacan's work has been uh, one of the ground of the feminist uh, uh, theory, which is for me uh, one of the most amazing uh, things, because uh, Lacan was explicitly an anti-feminist thinker, and all his work has been f um, built to oppose the damages uh, which, in his view, the feminists were uh, imposing on society, which is the devirilization of society, uh, the 
trade of homosexuality, masculine homosexuality, and so on. And uh, the women who want, as he put it, the women who keep well particular, who want to wear the trousers, and so on. So it, it, Lacan was one of the most reactionary anti-feminists, anti-gay uh, thinkers. So I want it's time has come to get rid of this Lacanianism as a, uh, as a, the framework of what we do, and especially when we 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 want to, and not only because some Lacanian used his work as a weapon against gay rights, because I know some Lacanians who. Uh, want to do exactly the contrary and to use Lacanian work to support gay rights. But um, it's, not, uh, the, it's not only the, the, how we use uh, the Lacanian tools, it's uh, what it does in society when you reduce political and, and social and cultural problems and issues to uh, psychic processes, which is you, you don't see what is at stake uh, in, uh, for example, in, in, the, in the school system, in, uh, in, um, uh, in education and, uh, in, and in the culture and uh, where, uh, where the class issues are at stake and not psychic uh, psycho or psychological issues. Yes, uh, we'll be, uh, this is the plan, we, we can adjourn fairly shortly to have some wine in the corridor and, um, and chat informally uh, with, with DJ. Um, we also know that a lot of copies of the book here to say, and I just kind of remember that I was so if you want to purchase DJ's marvellous book, um, uh, you're able to do it at a very interesting price, I think. Um, uh, but perhaps before we do that, perhaps uh, there are some questions from, um, from those who come from the audience uh, for the DJ, if you'd like to. Raise now. Yes. One. Hello. Um, I was also very moved to read the book. I uh, read it in the French version a while ago. And particularly about the two chapters you mentioned about the uh, loss of uh, class identity and also the, the relations your father wanted to be remembered uh, from being uh, communist army followers. Into, in a sense, and you explain very well in sociological terms why, why it could be that suddenly, well, essentially no one, no, no party on the left who presents that in so that's the thing. And you're doing a very nice way, I've very well recently in the kind of public debate about that, and I think it's a, it, it is a very, very convincing uh, explanation, and I think the left should reflect upon that uh, instead of. Uh, Sort of replying in the most moralistic way to people who vote the National Front today, and it doesn't help. Um, but I want to say, your book uh, is about the sheer difficulty of being gay, a young gay man in the 1960s, 70s, in working class. That's the uh, You, But it seems to me, uh, publishing it uh, in English edition now in, in 2014, it seems to me almost that because society has changed, that it's, it's become almost essentially a book about what no one talks about, in, at least in the French context, probably in Britain we're better at that, it's about class essentially today. Because, and that's again in relation to the two chapters on the sort of loss of uh, class identity, who presents the working class in France today, politically, socially, culturally, who speaks about the working class? Who are the working class voices in the, in the media, in, uh, in literature? And I, you mentioned we got the answer last Sunday. It's the National Front. Yes. And uh, exactly. I, I, not that I, 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 I'm very happy <laughs> with that, but it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the truth. Yeah. Because in a way, you, you acknowledge that, and uh, there's no denying that it's to be gay, whatever your social background remains, remains a tough uh, uh, situation. Um, but as you say, you mentioned, it's also hard for me to be gay in the bourgeoisie and just yeah, you know, get back to the streets, to come to, to the streets uh, yeah, yeah. against the, that is probably yeah. the ultimate taboo. So, in a way, the ultimate taboo of the French Republic is class, because it's no one presents the working class and it seems it's a complete vacuum there. And the former national. So, I just wanted to know, to, 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 
to know what, what you think about As you know, it's a very difficult question and yeah. very controversial question because uh, I accuse the Socialist Party to be responsible of the rise, uh, the rise of the National Front. I accused it them, and I, I still accuse them now because it's, it's not their politics during the two past years. It is also their politics. I don't want to exonerate them from what they did or did not during these two past years. But it's something which started which, um, 20, 30 years ago when the intellectual, the organic intellectuals, the pre favorite intellectuals, started to dismantle, to destruct the all, all what we could consider as uh, the very, uh, the very uh, framework of what is to be uh, on the left, and uh, I mean class. Maybe we have to reframe the, the Marxist theory, la lutte, the, the class struggle. Which, oh, I don't abide uh, to that. I, uh, um, we have to reframe the notion of class, of course. We have to reframe the notion of, uh, of class struggle, of course. But this is not what their ideologies did. They dismantled the perception of society as divided between classes. And they replace that perception by uh, we are all individual. We, oh, th there is, a, you know, I can take an example of someone who is, I would say, one of the most uh, interesting cases because his book looks like a left wing book and it is a conservative book. I mean, Thomas Piketty, uh, Capital in the 20th uh, century. And he said, ah, oh, there is. There, is, there are inequalities which are um, higher on, uh, I can't say that, de plus en plus fort. Uh, uh. Social creation, creation. So, um, and he said that we have to oppose the, the transmission of capital through inheritance in order to because there are um, uh, unfair inequalities, and to get back to inequalities grounded on uh, le mérite, uh, which is uh, something which is completely uh, <coughs> conservative. This is a conservative stance, and Or the, the, two, the two last pages, the three last pages of the book devoted on François Furet, which is, what does François Furet uh, has to do, have to, to do here? And it's because it is his framework, l'autonomie des sujets, against the, the destruction of Marxism, of social sciences devoted to analyze, uh, to the analysis of uh, class determinism, class reproduction, to put that to set that aside and to replace that by uh, we are all individuals, uh, <coughs> we are autonomous subjects, and uh, inequalities will be, if we think in that terms, inequalities will, will be grounded on what every individual deserves, which is ignoring completely that role, for example, of a uh, uh, the school system, in the class reproduction, in the social reproduction. So, um, and his proposition is to, to add 10% to the, to the taxes to the richest people, which I, I do agree with that, of course, but uh, which, with that kind of book, as the, the Bible of the uh, governmental left, uh, we will have the National Front at 40 percent, and not only 30 uh, this year. Within a few years, because uh, they don't, or, or they, they have built a framework where classes have disappeared, and nobody cares about. No, nobody represents uh, uh, working class people in the public sphere, and um, I, I consider that um, to. 
to build a perception of the world is to build the world. If, if you say there are social classes, there are confront social confrontation, social struggles, this is one perception. And you have to choose in which camp you are. You are on the side of the workers or on the side of the, uh, the bourgeoisie. But if you say we are all individual and there are um, inequalities which are grounded in the very um, talent of uh, people, so it's a justification of inequalities. It's, it's, uh, somebody writes a very good article saying uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a manifesto for inequalities. And this is completely true, it's a manifesto for inequality not the unfair ones grounded on uh, capi uh, capital and inheritance, but the, the fair ones. Uh, and I know that people who are raised in the more destitute people in some areas of, uh, a lot of areas in France, um, they cannot go to the um, high school, they cannot go to the university, and if they go there, they, they are, uh, relegated, expelled from the system very, very quickly. And so it's a justification of inequalities. This is a right-wing book. And uh, if nobody sees that, um, it means that um, people who are uh, considered a, as deserving what they have, because if they don't go to the... If it's not a, a, a social de determination, but because of their lack of talents or uh, of course there will be all of these people from the working class will be left apart and they will nobody consider that as a group as a, as a class and uh, the, the the conservative what i call the conservative revolution in france in the le in the left was to consider that there was no there was no more, there, there were no more classes, there were only individuals. And um, this has have, this have led, uh, left people uh, unorganized, unrepresented, and they found a way to be represented by collectively, rationally voting for the national front, as they did before when they voted for the Communist Party. And um, all these people, um, I'm sure you, you saw this uh, um, uh, survey by some people in Sciences Po saying that it's not, uh, the, the vote for the National Front is not left-wing voters shifting to the right-wing uh, vote, it's right-wing people who are radicalizing their votes. But this is not true, and it's part, maybe it's, it's partly true, but I'm sure, and where do uh, the votes for the National Front is so high? It's precisely in the stronghold, the former stronghold of the left. The, the, in Un Beaumont, yeah, the, 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 um, the places precisely where people, uh, where the, the, the working class movement, the trade unions were, were so strong before. So if it, it, we cannot imagine that it is only the radicalization of the working class uh, people already voting for the right and now voting for the far right. No, uh, it's the people who are voting for the Socialist Party or the Communist Party who are now uh, refusing to vote or voting for the far right wing. Maybe not the older ones because it's Maybe it's too painful for them to vote for the the former and the previous the, the former enemy, but for their children, it's. Uh, I saw that in my family. My mother, when I asked, uh, "Have you already voted for the uh, the National Front?" She said, "No, no, never, never, n not even once, or maybe once. Okay, uh, maybe it means more than once, but but she didn't." What, what is interesting is that she was ashamed of having voted for the, social, for the National Front, sorry. So she was ashamed. But my brothers were very proud of having been voting for the National Front as 
at the very moment where they uh, uh, where they they uh, they have the age to vote, and uh, for them it's as obvious to vote for the National Front than it was for my parents or my family to vote for the Communist Party uh, 30 years ago. And this is very disturbing. And uh, once a vote is inscribed in the, the daily conversation, in the, the habits, in the, uh, you cannot undo it within a, f a few weeks or a few months or even a few years. It, it will take maybe 20 years to, to maybe it will, will not take 20 years at all because they don't want to change that. Uh, if you say they are social classes, you are considered as, as an archaic Marxist. Uh, we have to get rid of the, um, comment on dit, sur moi, le sur moi Marxist. The, uh, the, 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 the ego. The Marxist ego, super ego. The mass is super ego. We have to get rid. But I would say that if we keep one thing on the left of the Marxism, it would be the Marxist super ego. And maybe we can get rid of every, every, everything else. But to keep that, that there are classes, uh, oppression, uh, class confrontations, and there are classes. Cla uh, and, uh, and if the, the working class people are not represented in the public sphere and the political debates, they will find a way to, to, to be represented. And actually, they did find. And it's very successful. When they vote for the National Front, there are all the headlines and the TV program and the newspapers. So the, uh, um, what, uh, the, the National Front is winning uh, uh, cities and, uh, and so on. So uh, the way working class people are trying to be represented in the political sphere is a successful way. Uh, it's an horrible way, but it's successful. And I, I don't know what we can do against that. And not only we can denounce it, it's not easy to denounce it, but because if you denounce that, that situation and the responsibility of the Socialist Party on the left, the official left, you are insulted uh, under, uh, well, whatever. <laughs> Difficult to end on the notion of insult. Um, <laughs> <laughs> full circle. But, but can, I, can I make a suggestion that since we've, we've, we've gone past um, 7 o'clock, that we, we adjourn uh, to that side and okay. uh, continue this extremely stimulating discussion over, <laughs> o over some wine? I'm sorry, once no, more for no, my no, English. No, 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 <laughs> Uh, I would be very grateful that if those who haven't signed the attendance thing, it would be very just very informed for our record, so that would be extremely useful. Uh, please, please join us for some wine. Can I also thank both, um, uh, both Jeffrey and the TVA for, uh, uh, for that very engaging conversation. Thank, thank them.